In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, uh, if you take a look at your bulletin on the back side, it introduces our guest preacher this morning by the name of Dr. Garwood P. Anderson. But Dr. Garwood P. Anderson is the principal, the presider, the provost of uh, Neshota House Seminary, where our own Father Ryan went, and that's in Wisconsin. Very cold. And he was snowed in and couldn't make it. So guess what? You get to listen to me this morning. I uh, delivered the sermon for the, and was honored to do so, in the place of Dr. Anderson last night for Father Ryan's ordination, and I titled it A Witness to a Miracle. And I'm going to carry that theme over to uh, today. As we look at these three powerful, wonderful lessons that we have from the scripture this morning, I'm going to start with the gospel. I could, I could speak for hours on any one of these passages, and I'm going to have to reduce it all down into manageable bits this morning. But I, 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 I say that because these passages are so full of, of joy and hope and uh, wonder. The first one has to do with the gospel, and it picks up where we left off last week. You remember last week the gospel was Jesus being baptized. And then it tells us about John and how John understood his ministry, and he said, I, I was, I'm not the person that God is sending to you, but I'm being sent to you to identify the man who will baptize you not with water but with the Holy Spirit. And then he identified Jesus. Now, that's all has an aura of wonder and majesty to it, but let's think about Jesus as a human being, the human side of our Lord. We often think that he kind of dropped down from the skies with all this full knowledge and information and a single-minded mission, but he actually didn't. According to the gospel itself, Jesus had to learn. He had to grow into a relationship with God, and baptism was part of it. Now, it's interesting to focus on this little passage because it tells us quite a lot. Jesus is identified by John, the baptizer. Peter and Philip and James and John are young men who have gone out into the desert to hear John. That's how Jesus first meets them. And they don't know what's going on any more than any one of us would in that context. These are young men who are ready to do something with their lives. They're looking for something more meaningful. They come to John the Baptist. They make their commitment. They're baptized. And here's this other fellow named Jesus who gets baptized too. But John says something about Jesus that's intriguing. And so they go up and talk to Jesus and they say, where are you staying and Jesus says, come and see. So he took him to his house. Did you think that Jesus had a house? Did you ever think about that? Out there by the River Jordan, there were one of two options. He either had a vacation home, <laughs> which he may well have inherited from his grandparents, or he rented a place through one of those uh, online rental services, you know, where he got a whole house instead of a little hotel room. Anyway, Jesus takes them to where he's staying. He says, come and see. And they did, and they formed a friendship. It's a very human picture. They formed a friendship that would carry on for a brief period of time until it got really serious. Now, we're all familiar with the story of how Jesus called his disciples to follow him when he was walking along the Sea of Galilee, these fishermen. Oh, I'd love to go into great depth about that. These fishermen were not just local guys who went out on a boat every few days to get something for the family to eat. They were businessmen. We know this. 
because John and James held the contract to supply the priest, the high priest and his household, which was fairly large, in Jerusalem with the fish. And we also know this because of the homes that Peter and Philip and James and John had. They were right close together. You can still see the footprint of these buildings. They were large homes, and they were right close to the waterfront in a city that was bustling and economically very uh, expansive. So much would happen in Capernaum. Well, Jesus went with his newfound friends up to Capernaum and said, hey, this is the place for me to start my ministry. He had a strategy in mind when he chose that town. But was it then that he met the, the, these fellows? No. John tells us very clearly he met them after the baptism. Well, they travel up north, Eventually, they go to a little town called Cana. There we know Jesus, the very next episode, Jesus changes the water into wine. What are we to make of this? These are very human stories. And they put Jesus in a very human context. Over the ages, we brought, we brought pastels around this whole thing. And we, we've, you know, like the, the, the uh, video technique, you put a little fog in there, a little mist to kind of make it look mystical and strange and remote. It isn't. It's a very human thing to do. But therein lies the story. God takes the ordinary and transforms it. They didn't know what was going on, but God did. This positioning of Jesus, this choice of friends, this bonding before the ministry actually began, all of this was part of God's plan. He's going to take something so simple, so natural, so routine, and transform it, just as Jesus took the water and transformed it into the best wine anybody ever tasted. Now, that's the gospel lesson. And that's, that's the, uh, the, the heart of this, this miracle that I'm talking about. Last night, we had the story of how this Jesus who began a ministry and was getting some following. He came along. He decided he looked out on this crowds of people who were following him. He was moved by them, by their needs, by their hurts, by their loneliness, by their sickness, by their uh, heavy burdens they were carrying. And he called to these disciples he made, and he would say to them, something's got to be done about this. There's a harvest out there. And I talked about that in connection with the ordination of this priest. But understand this, all of it began in a very human way and with the transformation of the ordinary. Now let's skip ahead. We know how the rest of the story goes. Jesus goes out, he heals people, he preaches, he draws large crowds, they hail him as a new king. Then they turn around on him just like that. Public opinion can go just like that. And they put him to death. And he's raised from death. And these friends who had no idea what lay in store for them when they met him by the seaside now become his apostles, his representatives, his Vickers, which means they stand in his place and they go into all the world and they give their lives away because of what they have met, what they have known, how they have been transformed. All right? Now we come to the second lesson in Corinthians. Paul is one of those who hated the Christian movement, who hated Jesus, who was stood by when one of his leaders was actually stoned to death and then Paul had a meeting with the Lord himself. And a routine trip that was transformed into an epic 
making moment. Paul is now one of the leading apostles. He's out planting churches. He can't spread the Christian message too fast. And he's touching all kinds of lives. He writes to the Corinthians as he says something stirring. He says, you are saints. Have you ever thought of yourself as a saint? Again, I love icons, but you know, saints, uh, even an icon of our Lord up here on this picture, saints have these things around their heads. You know what that is. And uh, saints are painted in, uh, always in a very somber way, and they're very holy, and there's a special glow about them. You know what a saint is? A saint is someone set apart to God. You're set apart to God. You are a saint. It doesn't count on, it doesn't matter how good you think you are or are not good. It doesn't matter what you've accomplished in life. You're a saint. Why? Because Jesus has reached out to touch you. You've been baptized. You've been a member, part, made a part of his body. And Paul, starting off in this letter, wants to lift up that most amazing miracle. We are all being made a part of Christ himself. The ordinary is being transformed into something extraordinary. That's a powerful message, a powerful vision. If only I could believe it. But if you believe it, it will change everything. Now, let me tell you something about what happened last night. We made a priest. That was miracle enough. There's this long chain that reaches back to the very hands of Jesus himself. When Jesus laid hands upon those 12, he gave him his authority. They, then he laid hands on another 70. Then they went out and they formed churches and they laid hands on leaders. And that has formed a human chain that reaches down to today. I called that a miracle last night. The very fact that there is this ministry that continues on and continues on substantially the same. What is the message? The message is Jesus. What is the mission? It is to bring people to know him and the power of his resurrection. That's a miracle. It's continued for 2,000 years. We take that for granted. That little handful of guys who met Jesus by the river, who went to his house, his vacation home to meet him, who finally got him to relocate up to the place where he could start his mission, that little group has changed the world. I wish I could talk about how many ways that little group changed the world, and we take all of that for granted. That was so long ago. No, that human change just connects us right one to another. But none of them could know what lay in store. That's the point. God transforms the ordinary. He makes saints out of folks. He brings power to those who have none. He brings life where sometimes all we see is death. Now I want to come to that first lesson from Isaiah, and I'll do this very briefly. Isaiah makes a claim that is just stunning. Before I was formed in the womb, he says, God, you knew me. You called me by name. Scholars have pondered over the centuries who this person was that Isaiah had in mind. We call it one of the suffering servant passages. And as it goes on in depth, of course, Christians later would read it and say, that's Jesus. Jesus was formed by God. Jesus was sent by God. Jesus is the suffering servant, and rightly so. But that's not the end of it. That passage says what we've just been hearing. God transforms the ordinary. In the midst of this poem, the prophet says, I was about to give up on my work. I thought everything I'd done was in vain. 
I tried to bring your message to people. Now, I'll tell you something as a priest. You're going to have that experience. Get ready. You will have that experience sometime. But God says, look, I've got something more in mind for you than you can possibly imagine. It's too light a thing that I should send you to a handful of people. I'll give you as a light to the world. No wonder we applied that to Jesus. But it applies to us too. When you're at your lowest, look to the Lord. He transforms the ordinary. When you don't see a pattern or a point or um, an end, look to the Lord. The things we can't understand now will come to pass if we trust in Him. And we'll be a part of the victory. Can you believe it? We're witness to a miracle. Your life is a miracle. And all you have to do is trust in the one who transforms the ordinary. Amen.